Mm. We should really like embrace the idea of architects and architecture contributing to the wider conversation through all sorts of different means. Episode 82. Hello and welcome to the Business of Architecture UK. I'm your host, Ryan Willard, and this week I had the good experience of sitting down and speaking for ages actually we really enjoyed um, talking about all the different potentials of architecture and non-material architectural solutions um, that we can unlock with our architectural training and discipline and this conversation was had with Omid Kamvari, who is an architect. He's worked at some fantastic, prestigious architectural practices such as Foster's, SOM, Make, Hamilton's, Allies and Morrison's. Um, and in 2011, he set up um, Kamvari Architects, which is based both here and in London and also in Tehran. And he's got a, a long family history as well of being involved in architecture, which was really fascinating to sort of tap into and discuss. And more recently, he he has uh, set up the, or co-founded a company called Pheromone, which is an on-demand data aggregation company uh, for growing startups and SMEs, uh, focusing on precious resources resources on the right business development activities. Um, and it was really fascinating talking to Omid about the kind of the wider implications of being an architect, the latent potential that exists within the industry and different ways of diversifying and also proposing non-material architectural solutions and how that can be the beginning of great entrepreneurial ideas. So sit back, relax and enjoy Omid Kamvari. So massive thank you to all of you for listening and supporting the Business of Architecture UK for the last couple of years. Big shout out to those of you who have come to our live events, attended the webinars, and of course to those of you who have downloaded the weekly podcast and have been listening to them on your bicycles. And as you know, we love helping architects win meaningful and profitable work, but it's not always that simple to implement these ideas or translate them into something that will work for you. So what I wanted to do was to invite you onto a quick 15 minute chat with myself we can both grab a cup of tea and I'd like to ask you about what content you found most valuable and why and what you'd like to hear more of and I'd also love to hear more about your business and what you're building at the moment and where you are headed to business wise in 2020 so there's no charge or any obligation with this call just simply to find out how our content has been of value and if we get that far and with your permission of course what might be next what what might be possible and how Business of Architecture UK could be supportive of that. Does that sound fair? Brilliant. So if you want to book a 15 minute chat with me, I'm calling these calls the BOA UK Discovery Call or just simply a chat with Ryan. Use the link in the information and I look forward to speaking to you. Hello and welcome to the Business of Architecture UK. I'm here with Omid Kamvari. Welcome to the show. Thank you very much. We're sitting here on a very gloomy day overlooking the Thames in this wonderful brutalist hotel, uh, one of my favourite locations for doing a uh, podcast. Now, we've just had a wonderful conversation about all sorts of elements of architectural industry. You've had a life kind of dedicated to architecture. You've come from a family of architects. You've been involved in the industry from, you were saying, from about 12? Well, forced, yeah, it was forced labour, unfortunately, in my, <laughs> in my dad's office, but um, we won't go into too much detail. Was that, was that in Tehran? Or was it that was in Tehran, Tehran yes. Tehran. Yeah. Okay, so, you, yeah. so you've, got, you've got an experience of seeing how architecture operates in a different, in a different landscape, in a different culture. Yes. Um, you were studied at the AA, you're the founder of um, Kambari Architects, yes. and recently you've set up Pheromone. That's correct, yes. Which is like a, a data aggregation business correct and you're like a advocate for for innovation and for architects using new methods of thinking and also for the we were talking about that sort of the non-material architectural solutions yes so how did you get started let's, let's, um, let's as you said it's been a, it's been a bit of a journey to be honest so uh, i did probably uh, the stereotypical um, i followed the stereotypical blueprint for architectural success as i knew it uh, as you mentioned, I come from a family of architects. In addition to myself and my father, there's another six architects in the family. So wow. uh, you could imagine what conversations around the dinner table were like. So um, I've never been too far from the industry from a very early age. And I never considered doing anything else other than architecture. And uh, maybe that was a bit of a mistake. But uh, 
Um, nevertheless, it's been quite an interesting journey. So I started, uh, I did my degree at Greenwich, I did my diploma at the A and went on to do uh, a specialist subject, the Emerging Technology and Design at the time, which uh, forced me into the landscape of innovation in architecture. And I think prior to that, uh, it was very much a taste-based educational system for me, whereby uh, because of the privileged of growing up in a family of architects and uh, growing up uh, in a in a background of good design, mm. I presumed I had good design tastes and therefore uh, I was uh, a good architect. And I think the first time I came across innovation was when I went to the EA and began to challenge myself through the educational system there in terms of uh, how we can actually introduce a more scientific approach to architecture. And that got us into coding and parametric design. We were part of the first generation of really students to study with parametric design at the time developing uh, being part of the beta generation of the software development through Robert Eich at Bentley's. Uh, and subsequently, we moved on to doing all sorts of really different things with physical experimentation and physical material systems that um, allowed us to record physical behavior in a digital sense. So it was the very first time that I came across computing in architecture. Prior to that, computing was very much a drafting mechanism for us. So it replaced the pen and ruler and paper. But in that sense, we allowed the computer to calculate things for us. And that became quite an interesting aspect. Needless to say, once I graduated, uh, at that particular time in our in the history of architecture in the UK, we were really, uh, there was a few of us doing it, and there was a really big demand for it. So I ended up having a relatively good career uh, at uh, prestigious firms, ranging from Foster's to SOM to Hamilton's, doing all sorts of specialist modeling activities, specialist modeling design, which essentially was parametric design and rationalizing geometries in a sense that um, would um, reduce the cost of building, but also present to clients this narrative of being advanced and mm. innovative in a, in a uh, particular sense. Uh, that was the first time I experienced heartbreak at the same time, because uh, whilst being innovative in the educational system, when you come into the industry, you begin to realize that innovation... Uh, in the true sense, doesn't really happen within, let's say, uh, the top end of uh, the industry. It, it still happens in the mid to bottom range, uh, individuals trying to push boundaries on their, uh, on their own. But when it comes to the commercial kind of sense, innovation isn't very much a, uh, in, a part of the strategy. And I think that's when I first uh, started experiencing maybe uh, a bit of a disconnect between my architectural education mm. background, my interest in architecture, and what happened within practices, I think. And, and that's quite interesting that you say that, particularly you know, some of the firms that you, you mentioned, you kind of imagine them to be some of the most innovative, boundary-pushing firms. What, what, what do you mean with the difference between innovation in the built environment and, say, innovation that happens in academia? So it's, I mean, it's a very difficult and um, I mean, I'm sure everyone within the industry has a different opinion on this and I'm, uh, I'm sure people that I have mentioned, the office that I worked at, they are absolutely innovative because they're at the forefront of design. Yeah. But I think uh, when you take a wider view of this issue and you begin to look at parallel industries and what's happening elsewhere, you begin to understand innovation in architecture as a really minuscule part of the industry. Mm -hmm. It's not at the forefront, it doesn't really push uh, design development. And I think the commercial viability of a lot of projects, especially at the larger scale, outweighs what little innovation exists within them. Uh, we do have innovation, but it's not through the architectural means. We have innovation in terms of m and &E, we have innovations in terms of uh, developments in concrete and raw materials and so on. But when it comes to kind of architectural design and that sort of stuff, it seems to be absent, or at least from my point of view, it seems to be absent, especially when we compare it to other industries and how uh, quickly they expand and uh, improve uh, situations where we seem to be practicing uh, in the same way as we've done for years. And I can say that because I, I, I've been involved in it for so long through so many different, uh, let's say, geographical locations that I just can't help but to think that I'm still practicing in the same way as uh, maybe my father did 40 years ago and my other family members did 40 mm -hmm. years ago. Essentially, it's the same thing. The materials we use are different. The processes we go by, building buildings, we hope reduce that kind of constraint. But fundamentally, it hasn't really changed a lot. And I think that's where uh, I think innovation needs to happen if we are going to move forward from this mm -hmm. point. On. It's, it's interesting because you were saying earlier, it, it, you know, when we look at the tech industry, something like 
the smartphone is such a radical departure from... Well, there was an evolution that's kind of led up to that point as well, but the innovation of having that as a product is so sort of... It's a big step. It's a big step forward in, in thought and creativity. Yes. And, and yet we don't necessarily see that in the, in the built environment. Uh, yeah, I, I guess we do at certain conferences. I don't want to say it doesn't happen at all. It happens within academia. I think within certain conferences there are really or certain groups of individuals that are pushing the boundaries in terms of particular niche aspects. Mm. But in general, I don't think we embrace it as as much. We were having this conversation earlier. I think it's a bit of a... I find it quite strange that, you know, uh, within conferences, there's always a lineage of uh, discussion. So we always refer to history and we, we seem to kind of discuss architecture in terms of what's happened before, what's happening now, and very little of what happens in the future. And I always, I always find it fascinating. You look at Apple's new release of the iPhone, it's like Tim Cook getting up on stage and describing to us how the phone evolved first before explaining why this Apple iPhone looks the way it does. There's some, uh, th when you, this is what I mean when you compare to other industries, we do some things which I find quite strange and that, that's not uh, me suggesting that there is no value in them. Absolutely there is value in them in understanding them. But the constant reference towards our historical past to, cer to a certain extent I think prevents us from understanding what we need to do in the future. And it really holds us back because uh, at, you know, even in ed education, context is always at the forefront of what we think. And uh, whether we like it or not, the context that we operate in is a historical context. It's not completely, utterly new and innovative. Mm. And therefore, it causes a bit of a problem in terms of how much innovation, I guess, we can push in terms, uh, in terms of design. So how has this shaped your own practice? So you were, you were working at these larger firms. And when was the, what was the departure point that had you lead and set up your own uh, Canvari architects and then, and then lead on to Pheromone? Um, so, I, at the time we were parallel to practice, I was always interested in education purely because that was part of the blueprint of a successful architect. Uh, I say it with a smile on my face because I can look back and say, I don't want anyone, I don't want any young architect not to go into education because it's a wonderful experience. At the time, I was really involved with the uh, AA visiting school while I was in uh, one of these practices, and I think it became a bit too difficult to manage multiple courses at the AA and also practice. Uh, because uh, I guess I was less efficient at doing the job that I was hired to do there. Mm. So uh, I had a clear choice to make, uh, to stay within these practices and carry on down the path that I uh, I was going down or begin to sort of venture out on my own and figure out a way of doing it in a different way. Uh, and I think I chose the latter purely because I found it a bit more exciting. And for, for years and years, I was involved in the program and we did multiple visiting schools elsewhere, which at the time... Uh, looking back on it was uh, was probably the most innovative thing I was working on because a decentralized education system mm. is a really interesting concept and I think it's something that still sits um, uh, at the forefront of architectural education at the A at least. Um, but uh, that was the starting point for me thinking about doing different things. Parallel to this, I set up my own office. So 2011, uh, I set up Canvari Architects and then I went through the second iteration of my journey in evolution uh, into what I am today, I guess, which is a bit of a um, mixture of different things. So uh, the office operated from a base in Tehran at the time in London, and uh, we were successful in the initial years to uh, leverage off the back of the experience that we had at the bigger firms to kind of secure projects as any young practice would to a certain extent. Uh, but uh, through no fault of our own, I'm going to say no fault of our own, but I'll add a little asterisk in here. There was uh, We had some major issues in terms of how we marketed the practice and how we went about uh, practicing in general, which is what I mentioned earlier on, that despite the fact of everything that I preach about innovation, when it came to set up my practice, I was a bit outdated in terms of how mm. I did it. Um, how do you mean? Uh, so I think I followed the same principles. Uh, so I came out of a big office and I thought if I pretend to be a big office, that should lead to success. So, And I don't think it really works like that business. Uh, and I didn't really consider business. I didn't really consider marketing. I didn't really consider how uh, I'm interested in clients. The, all the things that I'll discuss in a bit in regards to what's happening with Pheromone, I never quite considered. And that was because I didn't consider it business. I just fe felt that this is... Uh, I studied architecture, therefore I am an architect, and therefore someone in the world is going to come along and say, you do wonderful design, here's a commission. 
And I never really uh, spent a lot of time in terms of developing the business or designing the business. I think as, as time progressed, as uh, work fluctuated in the office and we went up and down in numbers, towards the end, we began to really challenge what an office was mm. and what, what is it to be an employee of an office? What does this really mean? And I think uh, it didn't lead to commercial success for us, but it really opened my eyes in terms of what we could have been and maybe should have been. And and you were operating in in both Tehran and in London. You had so you had two offices. Uh, yes, so. we yeah. Uh, it was part of a. I think uh, that was the only business decision I made, which uh, turned out to be the wrong one. <laughs> uh, but uh, uh, you know, if you're a young firm, you either compete with the big boys within the same place as you've got experience, or you take that experience and you begin to project it elsewhere in in the world and sort of suggest that you could do. You could bring that same language and intuition, what you've learned to those countries. And I think for us, uh, Iran presented a great opportunity in terms of um, getting bigger commissions, which would have been difficult for us as a young office to yeah. do in London. So we hedged a lot of energy and we bet a lot on the Iranian market. But um, yeah. I'm, again, I've got to constantly add notes in here. I was going to say through no fault of our own, that went wrong because of the political situation there. But I think... Uh, had I been uh, a bit cleverer about business, had I been a bit more understanding of what's going on within the global spectrum, I would have understood that it was a super risky environment to be in and therefore maybe putting 80% of your energy into it is not the best way to do it. And I think I learned a really tough lesson by doing it. Uh, so uh, as the administration changed across the world and you know, governments, uh, this is the problem when you're operating a business in these environments is that you realize that governments change every four years. Attitudes change every four years, but you're still trying to operate within the same environment, and that could be quite difficult. So we uh, we stopped operating in Iran probably uh, about a year ago, I would say, a year and a half ago, because it just became a bit too problematic. What were, but, the, what were the sort of unique constraints that you were experiencing there that you wouldn't say experience? Yeah, so I mean, the, uh, it's been uh, it's been the news quite recently, and it's been. Uh, uh, it's been an open discussion. Sanctions, for example, and economic sanctions that have been passed on have been difficult in terms of operating any business, especially if you're a business that needs to send funds there or get funds out. Right. So that became practically impossible. Not to say we never sent extraordinary amounts of funds, but the the notion that we could at some point be able to subsidize each office through the projects that we would accumulate was always there. And I think that became impossible to do. Uh, so therefore, it just became a bit more of a difficult Mm -hmm. uh, environment to operate in. And I think parallel to this, fortunately, unfortunately, I began to work with a number of investment firms there, which added a certain perspective to, let's say, the business of architecture. Uh, and then when you begin to look at it in a very different way, from a business point of view, you begin to understand that it, it seems to be an irrational decision to continue down this path. So we stopped operating, we retreated back to the UK. Unfortunately, at this time, the UK uh, was going through its own uh, fantastic turmoil, which is Brexit, that continues to this day. So even operating in this environment became quite difficult for us because we were absent from it for, for some years. So uh, the general experience I had uh, allowed me to sort of take a step back. So I, at this point, I'm again a startup architecture firm. I'm no longer a firm that's operated for seven years because I'm starting from scratch to a certain extent mm -hmm. again. Uh, with the added benefit and advantages of having learned a few really crucial lessons from business and business management and investment and how clients think about architects, uh, which has allowed me to sit down and really think about how I want to operate a business and what that architecture firm might look like, uh, which is the new venture that where we've started with a co-founder, Aydin, a really good friend of mine from back in Iran, who... Uh, went a different path. His dad was an architect and a really close friend of mine. We grew up together, so we had a lot of conversations about architecture. And then eventually, uh, in a, a session not too dissimilar to this, where uh, without the microphones, we had a conversation. And I said, look, I'm at this point where I need to create a new firm, basically. And I want mm -hmm. to do it in an intelligent way. I don't want to do it in the way that I did the firm that I initially had seven years ago, where uh, you're... you're told or you're taught that you need to buy comfortable shoes and go out there and shake people's hands and make uh, connections and I agree with those connections but uh, general connections don't lead to to anything you need to make specific connections and I think 
the conversation started with how do we do this? How do we begin to do this? How are other industries doing it? That, that's really interesting. Can I just focus in on that? that what, what do you mean the difference between a general connection and a specific connection? So uh, I think... Um, yeah, so architecture deals with the building environment. So we presume that anyone that's developing buildings could be a client. Uh, and I think if you look at other industries, that's not the case. No one says that anyone that walks is going to buy a Nike pair of trainers or an Adidas pair of trainers. They're, qu they're quite specific about how they develop the designs and they know what segment of the population they're aiming those designs at. So there might be a big enough company like Nike where they've got a variation of uh, styles and conditions for different people, but they're quite specific about how they do those things. Yeah. I, I'm not saying everyone did this, but I certainly thought that because I have an education in architecture, I can design any building for anyone anywhere in the world. And I think that's a very big mistake to make. Mm. So in the second iteration of this office, when I sit down to think about what I want to do, uh, I think the challenge becomes about trying to figure out, fine, so the developer is the person that I need to contact, but do I need to contact Barclay Homes or do I need to contact Joe down the street that's super interested in innovative design and 3D printing because that's what I'm interested in, or advanced computation and scripting and all those kind of things. Uh, so the question for me uh, becomes how do I do this? So I know, already know that I don't want to do the first, I, I need to do the latter because that's what my expertise lies in. But to find them is either putting on those comfortable shoes and going to sing every single conference and hoping for the best, which means you're never in the office, which means you can never design anything, <laughs> which means you can't do all of those things. So you've yeah, got to find a how, better... And how do you fund that as well? You, like, you got, as a small office, it's impossible. And that's, I think that's, that's the other lesson that I learned from the first... I don't want to call it a failure because it still continues. No, it's, 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 it's like the learnings. Yeah, so the first, uh, the second evolution we call this now, um, is that we never considered this stuff. I think uh, I just purely thought because I can design and I, mean, it's a, I know it's a, it's a difficult thing to say. I thought we did wonderful design I'm, you know, and I presented to the clients in that way. I don't want to be arrogant about it but also don't want to sort of be too down about it because there was a team involved in it other people contributed it wasn't just me so everyone tried the best to do the best designs possible but we thought that was enough we thought that if we get an article published in the age that's enough then all of a sudden uh, the clients will start knocking down the door and sort of asking for for us to do commission you know we did competitions we won competitions and nothing happened afterwards um so i uh, I think it's a bit it's a bit problematic. So I learned that that's not the solution. You need to be out there and you need to address them. But having said that, as a young firm with limited resources, can I go out to every conference? You know, these conferences charge money to enter. So it's £100, £200 to go. Things like MIPPing where everyone says, oh, you should go, which is really lovely to go. But as a young office, can you go? Can you afford to do it? Uh, not particularly. So what is the other solution? And I think the solution for us... Uh, has been this discussion that's evolved into the company that we've called Pheromone. Um, and I think it comes from data. I think uh, I'm at the position where I think, uh, based on everything that I've learned about business, first I need to understand what the real issues are. Mm. Uh, I need to understand what is going on within the construction industry. And I don't mean that in terms of, let's look at a few surveys here and there, in terms of people's opinions and the general outputs about how much was built in terms of square meterage and you know, wh how many houses were delivered, but let's really look at the the, the data in detail. Uh, how many two beds are being built every year? Where are they being built? What is the highest density of them? How many one beds? How many studios? What developers are building two beds? What developers are building houses? This kind of data that seems to exist for the majority of other industries, but is absent in our industry. So one of our challenges with Pheromone is actually to be able to understand data in terms of general principles initially. We're not doing this just in architecture. We're doing it, we're very much treating it as business and as a startup. We have clients within the logistics sector, within manufacturing, within robotics that we're dealing with at the moment. But the ambition for me is that at some point it begins to kind of start to answer some of the questions that I have in terms of managing a business and architecture. And once I have that data, uh, I can begin to make an assessment in regards to how to optimize my pitch mm. uh, towards clients, how to find the clients that are interesting to us, how to find the clients that would find us interesting, which is a really important point, uh, and how to begin to start a conversation with them around those interests, rather than what I did in the first iteration, which is 
typical uh, leaflets, brochures, uh, you know, all the things that you, you feel like has value, but uh, points, points you in the wrong directions. Mm. No, uh, uh, I think there has to be, a, in the 21st century, there has to be a better solution to shaking hands and comfortable shoes mm. and attending every conference. And I think digital tools and evolution of the business of architecture is important if we are going to continue to be of relevance within, within this marketplace and be able to offer a solution which is currently absent within the market. Mm. So, so what is Pheromone then? What does it do? How, is, it, is, it, is, it, is it more like a service or is it a product or is it a piece of software? Or when a client engages you, what are the sort of steps that they're going through? And, uh, so um, Pheromone is a uh, piece of technology, essentially. So Pheromone uh, is a data aggregation platform, uh, which means that we can collect data from multiple sources, whether they're external. So external sources could be websites, there could be subscription paid websites uh, or internal sources. Uh, and then we can collect this data, translate it into one easily understandable set of data points that you can begin to analyze uh, and understand in different ways. Uh, this could result in numerous things coming out from lead generation to pricing analysis to competitive analysis to basic tracking of, uh, let's say, companies and other things through all the public available data that exists out there. So. Um, let's say a highly specific version of uh, Google search, which allows you to kind of be quite specific within your industry sector about what kind of information that you want. And why is that important? Um, I, I, uh, so again, it goes back to lessons that I've learned in terms of business. If, if all other industries are doing this, if all other industries understand the metrics by which they're designing, the metrics for the customer bases, you look at online advertisement, uh, the simple answer is that we all opt into cookies because when we look for something, we get all sorts of different suggestions. So there's uh, embedded intelligence in that in terms of understanding that in this particular day, I am interested in um, oranges. I don't want to use the same example as before. I'm start, pl I'll start plugging a company. Uh, so therefore, any advert that I see on any browser that I search or website that I search is somehow related to oranges. Mm. Um, so that data is essentially being used to optimize uh, how you view advertisement mm. and it allows the companies that are selling these products to be super specific. So they point those products to people that are interested in them, which is exactly what I'm discussing in terms of pheromone. We don't have a equivalent of that in architecture because we don't really have the raw data. We don't really understand what the speciality of each company is and uh, what product they're selling and who they're pitching to. And I think uh, we need to do that in order to be able to evolve, to be able to address some of the issues that we have. Uh, fundamentally, what I'm really interested in, I mean, this conversation came, uh, I should sort of reverse a bit, Pheromone's first iteration in terms of a company was developing a parking app for the Iranian market right? Um, because uh, of my interest. Uh, so that's the kind of thing that really interests me at the moment is the non-material architecture. I think uh, the very, uh, again, I, I think um, our educational system, the history of architecture, the people that we uh, um, consider heroes within this industry have all developed a reputation around the built environment. And therefore, I think it's very difficult to think of architecture as something which is beyond that or something which is, uh, is slightly different to that. Uh, I, uh, um, with a through, ex I don't know if this is experience or not, but I... I've learned to understand, you know, we had statistics when, in, when working in the big offices, people used to float around statistics that 90% of our fees are earned from things that don't get built. Um, yeah, I've, I've come across similar sorts of yeah, so notions. You, you automatically understand that 90% of what you're doing isn't going to be built. Mm. So does that only mean 10% of uh, your effort is architecture or not? I actually think okay, that 90% has to have something to say for itself. So there is, there must be value in that uh, in that 90%. We don't gain much from it, but uh, there is definite leverage of sites by developers in terms of the unbuilt to uh, release funds and do other developments and sell out a profit. So there is value in it. So the non-material has value, but it's not something that we really consider. At this point, I was very interested, and we, we tested this in the office through um, different products, actually. The first, the first time I came across pollution as an issue within the urban fabric was in Iran. Iran has, uh, Tehran has one of the highest pollution rates in the world. Uh, unfortunately, 
um, uh, it leads to a lot of fatalities in in people with asthma and all sorts of things. It has all sorts of medical issues. And the first time I came across this was uh, when I operated the office in Tehran. Every so often, the guys would call up and say, "Today we can't come to the office." And I would say, "Why?" And say, "Oh, the government's." Uh, said everyone needs to stay at home because the pollution level is so high. You shouldn't leave. Uh, you shouldn't leave the house. Wow. So you know because people commute to work and that adds to the pollution and so on. Now I don't know if that was true or not, but it sparked. You know it might have been just an excuse because they were tired, uh, but it's uh, it caused an issue. So it, it sparked a little project in the office which we ended up calling um, uh, modular urban furniture, which was this idea of using plastic bottles to recycle them uh, into a scaffolding system that would allow you to plant uh, um, uh, sort of all sorts of plants in that would be oxygen producing to a certain extent because uh, vegetation is one of the main reasons you can kind of reduce pollution. Um, that idea was was really interesting. We thought about crowdfunding for it and all sorts of different things, but unfortunately, because of the issues that I mentioned uh, before, we stopped the project. But the, the the idea remained with me that if we want to remove pollution from the air, there's all sorts of things that we can do in the construction industry as it's become, um, everyone knows about this, is one of the biggest polluters. Maybe is not the best solution for these kind of things. Um, so the first conversation we really had was how do we begin to resolve this? And one of the first stats you come across is that 30 to 35% of pollution caused by cars is in situations where we're trying to find parking. And I think the first... The first iteration of the company was trying to resolve this, what I think, which is a super architectural problem, pollution within the urban landscape is, is I know it's a byproduct of a lot of other industries, but it's a problem that architects need to consider, and they do to a certain extent, but maybe not in a technological term. Well, so how do we resolve this? So the simple answer became that if we can produce a system that allows you to park a car in a rational way that stops you from having to look for a car parking space for 40 minutes, then we could go a long way of reducing, in regards to reducing that 30 to 35% of pollution caused. And that might be enough to be able to get the levels down to a, a, a level which then the staff can come to the office. <laughs> I, I, there's always benefit in the end of this for, for <laughs> oneself. Um, so that's where the conversation began. And then slowly but surely that conversation evolved in, into all sorts of things. We couldn't, uh, we didn't go ahead with the project because of the, obviously, the problems that we had uh, in terms of geopolitical condition in Iran. Uh, but that has evolved into all sorts of different things, mm. which has led to the non-material stuff. Uh, at, the, at the moment, we're really concentrating on the primary factor of this, which is the data. So we're really interested in collecting data in terms of all sorts of industries. My personal interest, obviously, is architecture and the construction industry to be able to understand where we really sit. Because I think without that data, without a proper analysis of that data, it's very difficult to place where we want to go in the future, what the challenges could be. Uh, historical trends go a long way in, in terms of uh, highlighting certain aspects to us. Um, uh, so the primary focus has become for the office, how do we begin to deal with the non-material aspect of yeah. architecture and how can technology begin to be a, a um, uh, important factor within how you develop an architectural practice? And this is really fascinating to me and I love hearing these kinds of stories of a traditional setup practice, the lessons that are learnt from the, you know, the, the constraints that most architects will experience when running a, uh, a, small, a small business. And actually, the, the, the amount of untapped potential there is when we start applying architectural thinking to this sort of non-material world and the sort of solutions that we can start providing for the built environment that aren't dependent on, on buildings. And it takes a little leap of courage and faith and experimentation and innovation to start figuring out how that can be turned into a business, how it can be monetizable. What, what do you think are, how, how would you like to see the industry kind of encourage more this non-material architecture? And what would you say to sort of students and, you know, because you, you know, you're, 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 you're an academic as well, where you, you, you teach a lot, you, you're teaching at Brighton at the moment. I do, yes. Um, how well, do that you, might get me fired. But, uh, <laughs> how do you how do you shape this conversation, or what um, do you think it's interesting? You know, I, where is our education system lacking? Uh, I, I really, basically, I think if we're bound as architects to the built environment, and I think it's I, I don't I don't want to be it, it sounds like I'm bitter about it because I 
I obviously haven't built a lot, but uh, within the practices that I work, a lot of the projects got built. So um, I don't have a problem with it. And I, you know, I'm the first person to walk past the building and say, I did a little bit on this. I did a little bit on that. And uh, I, find, I always find that interesting because that's uh, that's the kind of uh, vision of a hero that I had in my head when my when my dad was doing it mm -hmm. when, when I was a child. And look at this lovely high rise that's going up. And it was isn't amazing to stand in front of it and say, this is my creation. But I think uh, I, the necessity to constantly refer to the built environment uh, causes us to maybe um, miss opportunities elsewhere uh, that are still as valid as an architectural building is. Um, this might be an extreme example, but uh, applications like Uber... Uh, uh, Bolt, I don't know, Doorstop, all of these applications which have a technological solution to the way we occupy and use a city, for me are just as valid as a magnificent building that anyone would design in this city, you know, the Shard or the Gherkin or something else. They have a real contribution to the city and the way that we use uh, use or abuse a city. I don't know how you, it depends which side of this uh, uh, coin you sit on. Uh, so I think if 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 we broaden the discussion of architecture to include uh, aspects which are non-material that are to do with relationships between people, the relationships between how people use a city, how they occupy an urban condition, uh, then we begin to open up and broaden the conversation in terms of what one architectural practice can be, but also what architectural education can be. But I think uh, until we are willing to accept that that's the case. Mm. Um, it's going to be very difficult to do that because we go through an educational system which is uh, which is highly reliant on you and it becomes more and more reliant on you to design a building at the end of this process to be able to say I am a, I'm an architectural professional uh, or I'm qualified to design a building and I think uh, I love designing buildings I don't have any problem with it I still build I build things that are immediate if it's a sculpture if it's a, you, there's a necessity in me to build stuff which is quite difficult to explain to people you know especially my partner that comes to the flat every day and discovers a new item in there <laughs> that I've got to somehow explain part of a rationale of building but um, at the same time, I think we have to learn from other industries, and I think the technology sector is a fantastic example. They have a different um, understanding of education. Education for them is almost treated as an incubation process, where ideas are taken from uh, from the basis, and there could be magnificent ideas, anything that you could think of, which is what we do in architectural education. We encourage our students to think of big ideas, visionary ideas, and the history of architectural education has always been about visionary ideas. Um, but the thing they do in technology or in business differently to us is that at the end of that incubation process, there are people that encourage them to continue. And these very often become companies, Facebook, all sorts of companies are derived out of this educational process. Mm. But very seldom do we have an example like that in terms of architecture, because once they come out the other end and they hit the commercial sector and uh, try to earn a living, uh, working for a practice, the, uh, the notion of innovation very really quickly evaporates, I think, out of that process. So for me, I think the conversation has to be broadened, and this is a conversation that we need to get the stakeholders involved in, people like the RIB, ARB, and also the students have to have a voice uh, in regards to how they want to be educated. And we, I think we need a few disruptors. We need a few uh, people that are willing to risk, uh, or a few schools that are willing to risk uh, the problems that may occur from the RAB and all sorts of other people uh, in order to push the boundaries in terms of education. Mm. I constantly, when I talk about this, I constantly think about the visiting school program that we did with the AA, which was a two-week short, short program. And uh, having been involved in technology over the past two years, um, I've began to understand that all tech offices the majority of tech offices work on a management system called the Sprint system, which is a two-week cycle, which is uh, every two weeks you have a begin, you have a meeting at the beginning. Everyone's given a clear task for two weeks, and for two weeks they go, they go for it and they develop it, and at the end of two weeks they deliver that. And that visiting school program uh, at the time, which we just called a uh, workshop, 
uh, for me, his uh, b- uh, when I look at it now, is was a sprint. It was mm. a two week sprint in terms of taking an idea from zero to a point, uh, a proof of concept uh, that you could begin to pitch. But we never at that point said at the end of it, now go out and pitch it. We just kind of recorded it and then put it on a website and we pat each other on the back and said, job well done. And I think that's the bit that's missing for me. I think uh, if you look at all sorts of edu- other educational systems, there is a there is a post-education system and an ecosystem which encourages them to continue down that path. Mm. Uh, uh, more in technology, more so than ever, because um, there is a youthful um, movement behind technology. A lot of young people uh, are encouraging it. A lot of people that have made enormous amounts of money out of technology and the development of technology are plugging that money back into the youth and they're expecting the ideas to come from the youth. Uh, I go to a tech conference at the ripe old age of 37. I'm the oldest person in the room and it's a bit embarrassing, you know, uh, to sit amongst 21, 22 year olds pushing the boundaries of technology. And I think I, there's something really interesting about that environment to be in. You know, a conference room full of 22 mm. year olds trying to change the world. It's quite a powerful, uh, powerful um, and place and, to be, and it, and it doesn't. It kind of it reasserts as well the, the the cultural shift and trend that is happening with the relationship that people have with the built environment and the physical environment. Like people are more kind of you know the the the, the ability to be able to communicate and create communities online and digitally and innovate and have these kind of uh, systems that are plugging in and facilitating different types of things are very architectural in their in their sort of process and so being able to broaden that and have that as a conversation at university and also uh, realizing the value that we can as architects bring to these other disciplines these other industries is something that I think you know we should be relishing absolutely I think uh, I, I would go one step further and I would say that if we don't if we don't there's a real risk of becoming obsolete and I think uh, maybe I'm a bit too young. I mean, in, in the tech world, I'm an old man. In the architecture world, I'm too young. I always found it fascinating that the Young Architecture Award is awarded to anyone under the age of 40, uh, where at the age of 40, a hedge fund manager is retired. A tech guru has already uh, <laughs> done his job and is out. Uh, so there's a, you know, I, I think the youth have to have to run this. And I think if, we, if they don't take ownership of this, if they listen to... Uh, old people like me uh, and the fear of change uh, I use myself as an example because I did it I, I came out with despite everything that I'm saying to you when I first set up the office I did it in a super traditional way the office is called Camvari Architects because that's the blueprint of a of an architectural office your name has to be on it so no one uh, uh, you know you don't run away from the work your, your reputation is on the line and I think those, the, the, so I fell into the same trap, but I, I, through by chance or through experience of all the different industries that I've been involved in and kind of eclectic experience that I've had in terms of, um, let's say, uh, urban development, mm. because architecture is part of that, I guess. Um, I can now sit here and say, look, we, we have to change this. We, we can't continue down this path because uh, we're, we're we're blind. We're blind not, not only in terms of, uh, in comparison to other industries, but within our industry, we're blind in terms of what's really going on mm. because there is no real mechanism to capture this data and there is no necessity to do it. Where other people are using data for fantastic things, the dark side of it is that people are electing governments based on manipulation of data. That's how powerful it is. Data last year became the most uh, valuable commodity in the world. It overtook oil. Uh, so we're at this point, uh, it's almost, I, would, I use this in my pitch for the tech company, I say it's almost the same, you know, when they first generated the computer, no one really could use it until Bill Gates came along and developed Windows, which was an interface that allowed us to understand it. So I think we're at that point where we've got enormous amounts of data, it already exists, but we don't really have an interface that allows us to mm. access it, to understand it, and then to be able to use it. And I think where quite carefully positioning ourselves in that in that bracket where we want to be that platform which allows anyone to access data and to use it in a specific way uh, that allows them to make intelligent business decisions now that that could take the form of lead generation for someone but it could take a form of uh, data competitive analysis for other people but it's it has the flexibility to do that and i think 
um, we have to be open to this. We have practiced data-driven design. We have the tools like parametric design which allow us to do that. But it's not mainstream. For some mm. reason, it always remains as a academic project which you constantly refer to almost as a history, like the same way as I refer to the project that I worked on in MTech at the AA almost as a, a tomorrow actually I'm lecturing about a bit of research type of thing. Yeah, yeah I did oh this was the highlight I have pieces of that pavilion in my flat um, <laughs> <laughs> it's really you know bits of metal like what, what looks like scrap metal I mean, uh, I, I'm sure my tutors in MTech will, <laughs> will be um, reassessing uh, the relationship with me once they hear about this but <laughs> I have them in my flat because for me it was a really important part. It was the first time that we took something, uh, I mean, we designed a pavilion and every part was different and we manufactured it by hand at a in a limited budget and we constructed it and it went up and it remained on the terrace at the A for a couple of years. Uh, those elements for, for me represent a part of, a, part of a, an ambition that I had in architecture that never materialized once I left that institution. Mm. It became very difficult to practice it. And you do see examples of it, but you see examples of it at the same scale in the pavilion format in terms of research projects, uh, installations here and there. But it doesn't, it hasn't made the mainstream. And the only kind of uh, real kind of impact it did in, the, in terms of mainstream was uh, facade design and kind of dynamic facades and wonky looking things that you could then present as innovation, I guess. Uh, it's very surface it, level. It's yeah, so I think it's a massive shame. And I think it just doesn't happen in other industries. I think in other industries, they go to these uh, graduation ceremonies because they're trying to um, pick people out of the crowd that are going to change the world because their ideas are fantastic. They incorporate these ideas. And there's a real stigma, again, I, because one foot I have one foot in technology and one foot in architecture, I constantly refer to technology, but I'm sure it's the same in that industry. There's a real stigma for a tech company if you don't do it. One of the major aspects or major hurdles any tech startup has is recruitment. You you fight, you argue, you you make sure that you get the most talented people from the ta most talented institutions to come into your organization and really transform it. You give them leadership roles, you give them opportunities to express themselves, you give them hackathons, you give them all sorts of different things which allows them to kind of really take what they learned into the education process and incorporate. And then you're not afraid to use that in terms of what you're doing, in terms of your, your technology. As I said, if you're a 45-year-old CEO of a tech company, you're already too old and you know you're outdated and you have no fear of admitting that. Where in fact, if you're a 45-year-old CEO of an architectural company, you're in your prime. No, now you've made it. Now you've built 10 different bad buildings. So <laughs> therefore, you can... You can it's, I, when you do a comparison like that, it becomes a really strange thing to say. But that's the, that's the solution we have. And I think we need to embrace. If, if the education we give our students is not worth anything, then let's stop doing it. Yeah. I mean, that's the basic uh, principle. But if we're teaching them, if we're forcing them to study for five years and we're teaching them something of substance then we must be able to use it at the end. Otherwise, it's, uh, it becomes a bit of a Ponzi scheme where you come along and you pay for something that we teach you, we get paid to teach you, you pay the university, the university makes money, you come out the other end, you can't find a job, you don't really have uh, proper skill sets to fall back on. And so there has to be, if we don't value that education process, then let's rethink it. Let's do something different. Let's look at other models of education. Let's mm. build something else. If we do value it, then let's use some of the ideas that come out of it because uh, uh, the saddest part of every year is the exhibition at the end of the year. Where a year-long research into a wonderful building or a wonderful piece of technology is exhibited for a week and then placed quite um, kindly into a skip somewhere if you don't collect it in time. Yeah. And that's, for me, it's sad. You know, you go back, sometimes you go back over the prospectus of different universities over different years and you think of all the wonderful things that have happened, uh, massive amounts of innovation that have happened that you wonder what, where, where they all ended up. You know, the, if they're successful, they're designing um, a hospital somewhere. Mm. I mean, I'm, uh, some, some people are going to listen to this and think uh, this is terrible. No, yes, yeah, yeah, so there's extremes to this. But in general, in the general sense... If we're honest with each other, I mean, this is my experience. You don't really design super exciting things when you when you end up in the commercial sector. Um, and in order to do those super exciting things, I think you have to be independent. And when you're independent, you have all the issues that I had in terms of a firm. So therefore, you need the technology to do it, which is what we're trying yeah. to address now. Uh, but I think um, we have to kind of really reassess uh, industry at all levels, whether it's education, whether it's practice, the incorporation of technology, 
you know, I, it's uh, at the moment the most advanced thing that we can do in architecture is use BIM technology. Um, is it good? Is it bad? I'm not sure. It optimizes the design process absolutely, so it saves you some time. But is it really going to resolve the housing crisis? I don't really know. I'm not sure. I think we really need to kind of think outside the box to be able to address real issues that we have. Mm. Otherwise, other people will fill that gap. And we've seen that historically with all sorts of uh, segments within the architecture, what used to be part of the architecture profession, slowly dissolving to other things. It's, it's really, really fascinating. And I love your, your passion around it. And it reminds me of, uh, well, you know, Hans Hollein, for example, in the 60s was talking about how architects need to be thinking about moving away from the built environment, from physical space and getting involved in different types of haptic technologies. Mm -hmm. And, you know, even Cedric Price as well was a real visionary for the potential of architectural thinking and applying it to more ephem ephemeral, non-material ways of, of working. And also the, the things that are of concern to so many young architects and older architects, sustainability, the environment, social communities and things like this. There are so many different ways of non-material solutions that can be provided which are underpinned by rigorous architectural yeah. thinking and like you say the tech industry is hungry like because you know, what we often see in uh, in education is we see lots of very creative ideas and then perhaps you'll get people moving into the games industry or perhaps operating very boutique types of creative practices that are kind of research developed and you know there's a, there's an inherent there's a lot of that's, that's hard it's not it's not easy to do to run that kind of thing and there's also other industries where you can go in and get paid way more than you'd ever get paid in, a, in an architectural office and be doing stuff which is really at the forefront of innovation, working with lots of different things, and also implementing architectural thinking in a very unique way. So, Absolutely. I think uh, you're spot on. But unfortunately, we don't celebrate them in architecture. Mm. Uh, I think, um, you know, ev everyone knows that one uh, classmate of theirs that slightly veered off and did something amazing in a different industry that we don't really talk about. One of the, uh, I, I won't mention names, but one of our graduates from MTech ended up working for an algorithmic trading company because we were taught how to script, so therefore he could script and therefore he found more value in doing that. Uh, I have another colleague that's uh, a good collaborator of ours with Inferno at the moment uh, who set up a company called Automata that does robotic arms. Magnificent startup. They've grown enormously and they're doing beautiful, uh, beautiful uh, low-cost, let's say, robotic arms, which allows you to automate highly precise um, actions. And that kind of really came out of the education system because I was there when they first made the, the first robotic arm in one of these visiting schools. But we don't celebrate him. Now, if, if, uh, you know, for me, that's part of architecture. If he's challenging and developing a tool which allows us to look at architecture in a different way, then it's part of architecture. So, but uh, will he ever receive a rebut award for it? I doubt it, no. So I think if we continue to celebrate the material architecture, and that is purely building, you know, then it causes... Uh, a lot of problem. I know we're, we're kind of diversifying off of this conversation slightly in recent years in terms of how these projects are put together, social content, a bit of cultural resonance, but very often there has to be a built element involved in it for it to be taken seriously in architecture. And I think we should stop doing that. Mm -hmm. We should really like embrace the idea of architects and architecture contributing to the wider conversation through all sorts of different means. If there's a fantastic architect that graduated from a school that is working on sustainability in a very different way, in a non-material way, and uh, to prove a point, if there's an architect that's working on an amazing parking app because it reduces pollution, that should uh, be awarded the same way as a building is. And I think I'm painting a really extreme picture, and I know a lot of people... Uh, we'll listen to this and again say he's bitter about not building <laughs> but I'll uh, say you know I've been involved in it since I was 12 uh, I won't give away my age but that's it's a good uh, it's a good lifetime so 30 years of involvement in this occupation and I've built rubbish buildings I've built uh, amazing buildings and I've contributed to all sorts of different things so I'm not bitter about not being able to build I'm actually bitter about how I'm pigeonholed into constantly thinking that I've got to build in order to remain an architect and I think uh, I try I have conversations on the periphery of educational system when we're wandering through uh, the woods with students and I'm like encouraging them to think of it in a different way 
Um, but when when it comes to the mainstream, I don't think enough of these conversations are had, and I think it's absolutely vital uh, in how we move forward uh, in this industry. Amazing. I think that's a perfect place to leave it there. Thank you Thank so you much, much for your time. And that's a wrap. Thank you so much for listening, and don't forget to book your 15-minute chat with me by using the link in the information. I look forward to speaking with you. The views expressed on this show by my guests do not represent those of the host and I make no representation, promise, guarantee, pledge, warranty, contract bond or commitment except to help you be unstoppable.